station platter. Everything we do is for the seafood lover in you. Red lobster for the seafood lover in you. Valentine's Day is for sweethearts. And it's the perfect time to show her how much you care with a sparkling gift of love from Moody's Jewelry. Moody's family of jewelers will help you find her hearts and flowers to last a lifetime or gold and diamonds to encircle her love. If you shop at Moody's Jewelry, her Valentine's gift will shine forever. Because at Moody's Jewelry, your someone special is our someone special. It's the place for the Big Valley, weekdays at 9. ABC. Sunday. Sunday night movie. Tonight, a young reporter and a girl striking back at an invisible organization. Well, now you know everything. An incredible chase into a past nobody wants to remember. Yes, yes, yes! The Odessa File, a love story set against a background of terror. Starring Academy Award winner John Voight. The Odessa File. Drumming hands and M&M's. Chocolate candies. Drumming hands and M&M's. All hands love M&M's, cause the milk chocolate melts in your mouth. Not in your hand. There's a rich milk chocolate center, covered with a colorful candy shell. Clapping hands and M&M's. Clapping hands and M&M's. All hands love M&M's, cause the milk chocolate melts in your mouth. Not in your hand. M&M's chocolate candies. Get out those old records, those old photograph records, the ones we used to play so long ago. What if they sound scratchy, the tunes really were catchy, and especially those that said, I love you so. I used to beg you over and over just to set the wedding day to get your cordable. I'd bring my portable and I'd melt your heart away with all those old records, those old photograph records, the ones we used to play so long ago. Get out those old records those old phonograph records the ones we used to play so long ago what if they sound scratchy the tunes really were catchy and especially those that said i love you so i used to beg you over 
over and over Just to set the wedding day To get you portable I'd bring my portable And I'd melt your heart away With all those old records Those old phonograph records The ones we used to play so long ago I'm Don Drysdale. Swimming pools are fun, but uncovered pools can be safety hazards, even though most are fenced. Our Pool Saver automatic solar cover helps take the worry out of owning a pool. It's motorized to open and close in 60 seconds. Close Pool Saver's an excellent solar heater. In fact, many owners never use their pool heaters again, and it keeps your pool clean for solar heating, cleanliness, and safety. Call us at 566-9440. That's 566-9440. TV so easy, anyone can use it. Let's say you're an awards judge for daytime television. With Web TV, you can look up a website and watch television at the same time. And since you're so busy with your judging duties, Web TV can even remind you to watch a show like this one. Not that you're forgetful or anything. Web TV service, the internet, television, and more. People often ask, what's the real Bill Shatner like? I tell them, find out with Web TV. You can watch one of my many shows and be on the internet at the same time. Looking up websites about Shatner, the author, Willie the Cowboy, and yes, Bill the Rockstar. 
course, you could look up other websites and watch other shows. But why? Web TV service, the internet, television, and more.
wild and evil comedy, Return from Witch Mountain, next on HBO. Caution. This man is going to drive you wacky. He'll prescribe the best, the easiest, and the most bizarre ways of looking for fun. If you have a weak heart, bad nerves, or are expecting a baby, enter at your own risk. That's sound advice for some, but for others? What, are you a cop or what? No, we're just, uh, you know, looking for fun. David Letterman on the loose, looking for fun. Catch him. I'm certainly sorry you boys and girls had to hear that. Tomorrow. Hi, I'm Orson Bean. Ever wonder what on earth would happen if a meteor landed in your backyard? Or why dinosaurs died out? Or what's right about left-handers? Or what sleep looks like? And how much do you need? What's the strange bond between two twins named Jim? Can animals predict earthquakes days before they happen? We'll have more questions and answers concerning everything from meteors to dinosaurs on HBO's new science program, What on Earth? Tuesday. Burt Reynolds has a scheme to make some fast money. You're crazy, you know that. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> ah, yes. By the way, how much money did you say it was? dollars I'll be driving this one. Hey, uh, blocker, blocker. You'll be driving the truck. Right. This is Bandit 1, and that is uh, Bandit 2. And all they have to do is bootleg a little beer from Texas to Georgia without getting caught by Smokey Bear. We're gonna really have to cook. I mean, put it on the back burner and let's cook. Is that a 10-4? 10-4. Well, we've got, got a barbecue yard! Bandit, I got a Smokey report for you. What's your handle, son? My handle is Smokey Bear, and I'm tail friendly. you the beers on. Burt Reynolds, Sally Field, Jerry Reed, and Jackie Gleason in a good old country chase across the South. Smokey and the Bandit. Wednesday. This is HBO. The following feature has been rated G by the Motion Picture Association of America.
Well, my deepest apologies there. And uh, yeah, well, it's old school, truly old school tonight, I guess. So, you know, hats, because everybody did hats back then. Anyway, welcome to hopefully what is just a uh, rocky start to the Archive Land Public Domain Theater. And I'm just making sure that things are actually working here real quick. Um, the setup is that the only way I can monitor myself is on my laptop, which is just out of the shot. So yeah, my phone is my camera and my laptop is how I control things. And as you can tell, I am not controlling things too terribly well tonight. But anyway, uh, which is uh, discouraging because I was hoping to make this like a once a month thing, once every other month. Um, I thought I had all the bugs worked out, but apparently I don't. Anyway, uh, tonight we are going to be looking at Harold Lloyd's final film, The Sin of Harold Diddlebach, which came out in 1947. Now, uh, unfortunately, the short, short, it was a full two-reeler that I ran during the pre-show there, uh, that was intended to give the uninitiated an idea of what his character had been like, more or less, early on. Because what we're going to be seeing tonight is really Lloyd just deconstructing his own persona. So, of course, uh, Harold Lloyd was one of the big three comedians during the silent era. Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, and Buster Keaton. And uh, actually, Keaton was in a distant third. I don't think too many people know that. He was kind of the cult comic of his day. But anyway, uh, Harold Lloyd kind of personified the proper roaring part of the 1920s. Uh, the really optimistic go-getter, nothing's going to get me down. Well, it just worked out that as we were going into talkies at the end of the decade, we also entered the Great Depression and attitudes changed quite a bit, and that character kind of fell out of favor. Now, Lloyd did continue on into talkies, and he had a, a perfectly decent voice, as you'll hear in tonight's movie, but he, uh, he went kind of out of step with the times, and also I don't think he ever entirely learned how to pace himself in a talkie. There's some decent ones, and there's actually another Lloyd talkie that's public domain that I might run sometime called the Milky Way. But uh, anyway, we are up to the year 1947 now. So Lloyd's previous film had been in 1938, and it was a uh, kind of a stinker. It was a film called Professor Beware, uh, which is conspicuously absent from the Harold Lloyd box set that came out back in the mid-2000s, which kind of remains the big word on his career. So he decided, you know, he didn't really have to work anymore, so he just kind of retired, as it were. But uh, then he got the call from Preston Sturgis to make a new movie, and Sturgis is really best known as a writer, screenwriter, but he did direct some movies, and he's known for his very witty, very snappy dialogue. But uh, I guess Howard Hughes, of all people, wanted Lloyd back on the screen, and it was Howard Hughes, the billionaire, you know, if you've ever seen The Aviator, who got Preston Sturgis to bring Harold Lloyd back into the movies. And the idea was really to take, you know, what happened to the guy from the 20s? What happened to that really uh, always super positive, nothing's going to get me down guy from the 20s? Well, as it works out, he wound up working a dead-end office job for 20 years and got fired. And that's what this movie is about. Uh, actually, a, a better synopsis for this movie would be, Harold Lloyd gets really, really drunk and buys a circus after getting fired. So that's what we're going to see here tonight. Now, this movie was fraught with problems during production, uh, bickering between Howard Hughes and Preston Sturgis. And uh, Howard Hughes, as we all know, is a, a pretty eccentric figure. So uh, he was constantly putting his fingers into the movie, as it were, and he even started a new studio partially to make this movie called California Pictures, which did not last very long. Uh, actually, I think this is the only California picture, but uh, don't quote me on that. So anyway, it uh, this actually started work, I believe, in 1944 or so, but it took until, I believe, March of 47 to finally get a screening 
in Miami, and it was pulled from theaters. About a month later, uh, it got re-released, and depending on your source, I, I don't know how true this is, but supposedly it peaked at being in only three cities in America on uh, its original release. And the reviews were not so great. But uh, this is what we're going to be watching tonight. So uh, it, my opinion on this movie is it's half a really good movie. I think the first half is wonderful. It really follows through with the deconstruction of Lloyd's own persona. It's the beaten down, middle-aged, world-weary version of that smiling youth from the 20s. Now, uh, there are uh, two definite cuts of this movie, possibly three. So uh, Howard Hughes may very well have already recut this to some degree in 1947. By the end of the year, uh, he'd come up with a new title after pulling it from theaters the second time around. And that title was Mad Wednesday, which was come up with by an employee of his, I believe. But it took until 1950 for Mad Wednesday to get released. And Mad Wednesday is kind of a... It's the same movie, but it, it's restructured. It has a lot more visual gags. It's a bit more surreal. But it loses the wit uh, to a degree from the original. So both cuts of this movie are kicking around on public domain tapes and DVDs and stuff. So they're out there and I think you can stream everything on YouTube or archive.org or whatever you prefer. So anyway, we are going to look at the, what I believe to be original release 1947, maybe slightly tinkered with, but I, I can't confirm that. I haven't seen every print of this movie in existence. So anyway, we have Harold Lloyd in the cast. We have um, Rudy Valley, the singer, who was big during Lloyd's heyday. And also uh, Lloyd's latest leading lady, uh, a woman by the name of Frances Ramsden, I believe. And she's a, she's a Betty Page clone, physically. But uh, she's a, she kind of plays the typical nice girl that Lloyd always got. Having said that, there is a bit of an age difference. Uh, this, this movie does go into some darker places than most of Lloyd's work, and I think that's what makes it stand out. But yeah, I, I think the first half of this movie is quite good, and it gets kind of... It, it goes off the rails in the second half, as you will see. Uh, it really helps to be familiar with Lloyd's other more prime movies like Safety Lass, I'm sure. Even if you're not really into silence, you've seen that picture of Harold Lloyd hanging off the face of a clock at some point. That gets referenced here. Uh, so if you're a Lloyd connoisseur, there's plenty of in-jokes. But otherwise, I suppose I should stop yakking and start the movie and we'll finish up my little discussion on all this afterwards. Uh, actually, I slightly lied. I suppose I should discuss the print that we're running. So this is from Murray Hill Video, which didn't truly exist. Uh, if memory serves, Murray Hill was part of Reader's Digest but they just re reissued existing stuff. So this is actually from Crown Movie Classics. And Crown Movie Classics is already kind of infamous within the realm of Oddity Archive because it's the home of that version of Metropolis with the score that's really more appropriate for a Laurel and Hardy film. But anyway, uh, this is indeed a talkie, 1947. We're not dealing with any kind of oddball scores here. And this is actually a fairly decent print, the operative word print. The video quality is good. Hopefully it holds up for the stream. I'm very, very worried about that tonight. And uh, the audio, on the other hand, is bad. It, it's pretty warbly. It's choppy. I, I, there's not a whole lot I can do with it. There's nothing wrong with this tape per se, although it does get off to a rough start. But you'll notice with the opening logos that the picture quality is really bad. It clears up, but the audio is nice and solid. But when the movie starts, it's just the audio attached to that print or whatever they were doing to um, make the transfer for this. So anyway, uh, well, the, the beta deck is right behind me here, so I suppose I ought to pop it in and get us started. So if you'll... Hold tight for about one minute. 
we'll get this party started. All right, hopefully you enjoy the movie.
I do remember. I should certainly hope to kiss a pig if I didn't. Thank you. Now let me see. That was football, wasn't it? Or was it ice hockey? I go to everything. Football, Mr. Wagoberry. Football, of course. And I presume I promised you a job. I usually do when I get excited. Oh. But you shall have it. With me, your promise is a sacred pledge. My word is my bond. My handshake is like a certified check. My check is like a... He who loses honor loses everything. Right. We don't start people at the top, you understand. That would be too easy. We do it the American way. We give them an opportunity to work up from the bottom. What satisfaction. What a feeling of accomplishment you will have when you are able to look back from whatever rung of the ladder your uh, go-gettiveness would have placed you upon and say, I, I did that. Yes, sir. Fine. You know nothing about the advertising business at all, I presume. Well, I, uh... Good! Then you won't have anything to unlearn. You'll be able to start right in the basement, and your rise will be all the more spectacular. Every man is the architect of his own fortune. Excellent. 
I'm ideas. Uh, you could almost say bursting with them. But contain them, save them. Don't squirt them all out at once. The, uh, the idea department is a little congested at the moment. It always is, for that matter. There never seems to be any shortage of, uh... Oh, but that would only depress you. I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to find you a little nook in the, uh, the bookkeeping department. A regular little niche. You could almost call it a cranny. The rest will depend upon you. Well, thank you very much, but these ideas... How I, I envy you this chance you're receiving today. My, my father unfortunately left me the business. Oh. Just one of those things. You have no personal fortune, I hope. Well, no, sir. I, uh... Great, and probably only the clothes you stand in. Well, not exactly. I mean, this isn't my other suit. Oh, isn't it? No, sir. Well, no matter. Clothes do not make the man. On the contrary, as Shatner said to Marx, it's man who makes the clothes. See me, Chief. Yes, I'm sorry to say I do, Harold. How long have you been with us, little boss? About 20 years, I guess. 22 years. Too long. Why, it seems like yesterday to me. I mean that I started here. Well, it was quite a few yesterdays ago. The earth has cooled considerably since you put on your first pair of sleeve protectors outside there. Yes, I, I guess it has. And so have you, Harold. So have you. I don't know exactly what you're talking about. I may be a little older, but I'm quite sure that I... I had great hopes for you, little Bart. If ever I saw a promising type of American youth full of zing, full of zest, full of zowie, it was you. I remember that day I first saw you. The bases were full. The crowd was breathless. You strutted up to the plate, swinging three bats at once. What? Oh, no, it was hockey, wasn't it? Ice hockey, of course. You got the puck, and I... it wasn't? Well, what does it matter anyway at this point? A man is only as young as his arteries, Harold. And a firm is only as young as its employees. My father fired anyone who got to be 50. Man, woman, or child, it didn't matter to him. That was his motto, the cornerstone of his success. Personally, I found the method harsh. I do not subscribe to it. With me, a man is as young as his ideas. Yes, 
sir. I even participated in, or at least uh, closed my eyes to, a small deception some of the older employees practice when, because my father was extremely nearsighted, they dyed their hair and returned to work for us as their own son. Blessed Of course they are. Uh, unfortunately for you, Harold, my own eyes are excellent. You have not only ceased to go forward, you have gone backward. You have not only stopped progressing, you have stopped thinking. You not only make the same mistakes year after year, you don't even change your apologies. You have become a bottleneck. You are the living proof of the low quality of work we demand of our employees and a bad example to the younger employees who figure that if you can get away with it, they can too, and they don't have to be any better than you are, which is zero. But there are no buts. I, uh, I have uh, bought you a Swiss watch, 18 carats. It chimes. It is uh, properly inscribed with gratitude and love and kisses uh, for 20 years, devoted service, and so forth and so forth, and I herewith present it to you. Here is also a check for uh, mm, uh, $2,946.12, which uh, represents your your uh, savings deposited with the company. I'm surprised you haven't saved more in 20 years. Well, I had a lot more, only it was invested in the preferred stock of the company. And did you remember what happened in 1929? Oh, yes, yes, I remember. Of course, it was just as hard on all of us. You know, the little and the big. We all shared and shared alike, but that's all water under the bridge. Goodbye and good luck. And as a parting thought, I want you to know that this is hurting me much more than it is you, Harold. Much more. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Don't let it get you down. Thank you. It was football. Huh? It was football I used to play. Sorry, Harold. Thanks. Like that in cash, please. What's the matter? Don't you trust us anymore? Once bitten, twice shy. I'll have to get it out of the safe. I'll bring it over to your desk. Thank you, Charlie. You better buy a wig. Huh? Why? You'll find out. Here you are, Harold. Thanks, Charlie. Justin Dorset. Thanks, Harold. So long, Charlie. Might I speak to you a moment, Miss Otis? Certainly, Mr. Diddlebox. You mean privately? Well, with some privacy. You could look for something in the private cabinet. I never find anything anyway. Splendid. I'll join you in a moment.
Otis, ah. Uh, yes, Mr. Diddlebuck. Miss Otis, when your eldest sister Hortense came to work here some 17 or 18 years ago, I fell in love with her. She was a lovely girl. Yes, I know. I mean that you fell in love with her. She told me. Oh, she swept me off my feet. My circumstances at that time did not permit even the contemplation of marriage. I know, she told me. When she very wisely stopped waiting for me and married the gentleman whose life she has since illuminated, I felt that my own life was ended, that I would never love again, that the sunshine had withdrawn permanently behind the clouds. I know. Well, I was mistaken. Of course. Because when your next eldest sister, Irma, came to work here, I fell even more deeply in love with her than I had with Hortense. I know she told me. Hortense even got a little burned about it. Well, she needn't have, because when Irma and her turn, got married and was replaced by your next eldest sister, Harriet, I felt that everything that had gone before was merely an appetizer. I know. She told me, too. They were getting better and better. Your mother seemed to be making them nicer every year. Thank you. I haven't come to you yet. When Harriet ran away with that headstone salesman, I was inconsolable. None of us felt very good about it. I was going to propose the very next day. She didn't know that. I had the ring in my pocket. I just made the last payment on it, the one I'd started for Hortense. It came so close. I never felt so defeated in my life. I never thought I'd smile again. Didn't That's right. She was even better than the others. Might have had more practice. Practice makes perfect. By then, of course, I'd been wiped out in the market. Oh, was that it? She never knew. That's right. I started to get on my feet again when your sister Claire came to work. Why didn't you ask her? Didn't you like her? Like her? I worshipped her. Only that irresponsible lout, that loafer who married my sister, chose that very moment to kick the bucket with, to pass on without leaving even a dime's worth of insurance. Uh, so I found myself with a ready-made family. Poor Mr. Littlebock. I suppose you were in love with Rosemary, too, while she was here. Naturally. Of course, I was so in the habit of being in love with your mother's daughters but then that it would be impossible for me to even see one without... Without... Without what, Mr. Littlebuck? I presume you know I've adored you since the first morning you punched your first time card. You knew it, didn't you? Well, I... I suspected it. My sister had warned me. Of course. Imagine being exposed to seven Miss Americas and muffing the whole seven of them. Poor Mr. Littlebuck. Leaving here today. Oh, no, Mr. Littlebock. That's what I really wanted to tell you. I don't know where I'm going, and I very probably won't see you again. So, I want you to take this. It's all paid for. Someday, when you meet some young man who's really worthy of you and who has everything but the engagement ring, you can take that excuse away from him anyway and. Confidentially, I left my money on the dresser this morning when I was leaving. You couldn't let me have four dollars. I say, you couldn't let me have four. four. 
You couldn't let me have four dollars till Wednesday. That's my lucky day. There's a mag called Futura running at Belmont. And you don't have to go if you can't spare it. I just said if you happen to have four dollars you wasn't using and until Futura come well, in. Fool and his uh, money are soon parted. Yeah, but think what beautiful memories he lays up. How about two dollars till tomorrow? He who lendeth money endeth friendship. Oh, that's all right. We ain't friends. I never even seen you before. Well, that's a fine argument. How about a quarter for a racing form? This is day before yesterday. Oh, here, since you're so melancholy about yourself. Fish hooks? What? I say, maybe you caught your mitten some fish hooks. Holy Moses, Westerner, huh? Oh, here. What's the difference? Holy mackerel, you're a right guy. You stick to me and you'll be wearing ruby. No, I'm not. It's just that I've been saving it for 20 years and I'm getting tired of it. It's what you call an impulse, like a... Man works all his life in a glass factory. Well, one day he feels like picking up a hammer. You say you work in a glass factory? No, I didn't say that at all. No. It's just, oh, well, you wouldn't understand. But you needed a drink. No, no, I never touch it. I never have. It runs in my family not to. The demon rum. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Since you've been so generous and all No, no, me, I tell you, I have never in my whole life. You're never too old to learn. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Every dog is entitled to one bite. Well, let sleeping dogs lie. A barking dog never bites. He who sleepeth with dogs riseth with fleas. Now, wait a minute. How about uh, a little wine for thy stomach's sake? That's from the good book. He who has a taste is lost. Lips that touch liquor shall never touch mine. Uh, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Isaiah 28. You got me. What kind of a drink would you suggest? Nothing too strong, of course. How deep is your trouble, brother? How did you know I was in trouble? Well, I've been around quite a lot of it. I hear you. Did you ever hear of a Texas tornado? Not till this moment. Oh, you'll be surprised and amazed. Right huh? this way. What? Come on. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, come on. I shouldn't be going. Sure. Down in there. I mean, sure. sure. oh, come on. Don't flash that roll in here. I wouldn't want anything to happen to it. A wise man keepeth his own counsel. Fine. Come on. Come on. Good morning, gents. Good morning, Wormy. What's your pleasure? Jake, I want you to meet my friend, Mr. Uh, he staked me to a bankroll. Well, Foley, he must be new around here. This calls for a little celebration, Mr. Uh... Uh, Diddlebock. Harold Diddlebock. Diddle what? Diddlebock. Bock is in beer. Oh, I thought you said Diddlebock. Is it buckwheat cake? Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> the brother Diddlebock, uh, back. Uh, but what's the matter with me? Bock. Oh, yeah, Bock. He's in some kind of trouble. Who is He's it? about to have his first drink. His first drink? Uh -huh. Drown my kittens. This is quite a moment. You mean his first this morning? Or really his first ever and ever since he was weaned? I have never partaken. Now that I've had time to think yes, about it, I don't... sir. You never know how the other half lives. You arouse the artist in me. It was just an impulse. Well, obey that impulse. Why don't you have a cigar? Have a yes, cigar? Sir, I'd like to make you something. Hmm. Something you would remember. I wouldn't want anything. I mean, if I had anything at all, nothing potent. You understand? You never feel it. I was thinking of a Texas tornado. Oh, not for an occasion like this, Wormy. A tornado's a perfectly reliable commercial drink for conventions and hangovers and things like that. But this, this is almost, uh, is the word vestal? Huh? I mean, it ought to have organ music. I wouldn't want anything. I mean, opportunities like this come along all too rarely for a man with his heart and his work. Uh, tell me, Mr. Diddlebeck, about, uh, where were you born? Oh, uh, what? Nebraska. Corn. And in what year, please? 1901. Fine, fine. They distilled some very palatable stuff in 1901. Well, let me see. Let me see. Uh... <laughs> I wouldn't do this for everybody. I wouldn't want you to. Hey, you leave it to me. You just leave it to him. 1901, 1901, a sort of meeting of old friends, brothers under the stars. 
It ought to help your personalities to get together. Or don't you believe in astrology? I've never thought much about it. If you're making that for You me, believe in personalities? I suppose so. I, How uh, about posterity? What? Posterity is just around the corner. Now, oh, just a couple of technical questions. Would you like it frappe or flambe? How? Do you like ice skating or turkey span? I used to skate a little. Frappe. Frappe. Now, would you like it sweet or sharp? I don't really... How do you take your coffee? I uh, take milk. You've answered my question. You prefer showers or sitz baths? Well, we have a shower over the tub, but there's always the danger of stepping on the soap. Vodka. What? But vodka, you don't care what you step on. You can step on snakes. Now, wait a minute. Now, just relax. One final question. Do you prefer the taste of rosemary or wormwood? Who or who? Do you like Benedictine or absinthe? What? What kind of toothpaste do you use? Sozodont. I got gotcha. you. If that's for me, you just leave it to him. What a scientist. Ain't that pretty? I wouldn't want anything to, uh... They call him the professor. You just leave it to him. Oh, boy. Gentlemen, the diddlebark. Ain't he wonderful? A genuine genius. <laughs> Certainly very kind of you. Don't mention it. And if you don't mind, I'll uh, sample a mouthful with you. Well, I certainly hope you will after mixing up this much. The artist does not weigh his clay. You're very good health, Mr. Diddlebart. Here's to you, Mr. Diddlebart. <coughs> Ain't that something if I do say so myself? That's certainly very kind of you. I'm only sorry that you made so much of it. Certainly the last thing I ever expected was to have an alcoholic refreshment named after me. Very attractive aroma. Very mild. Nothing to it. I wouldn't say that. But it has always seemed to me that the cocktail should approach us on tiptoe, like a young girl whose first appeal is innocence. What a poet. Here's the innocence. Bottoms up. Over your ears. <coughs> Doggone if he didn't inhale it like an expert. Welcome to the Brotherhood. Is that all there is to it? You are now a member in full standing. That's uh, very, very pleasant. Just a little dividend. Uh, just a drop. You'd uh, never guess that you'd make so many different flavors in it. Like a poem. I suppose there is some alcohol in this. I will not deceive you. There is. You'd never know it. That's where the skill comes in. What a scientist. There ain't hardly another mixer in town could do you a thing like that. Oh, boy. <laughs> Lovely. Just like velvet. What was that yelling? Did you hear something just then? <laughs> to innocence. And still more innocence. What is that <laughs> yelling I keep hearing? Or is it my imagination? I wouldn't drink too many of them too fast if I were you. You know, just beginning and all. It ain't as if anyone ever drank a little box before. You can't tell what it'll do to you. This lemonade. Shake up another batch of it. Shake up a bucket. Oh, oh wait a minute. What are you talking about? What are you looking at? Who, me? Nothing. Hurry it up. <laughs> what is that yelling I keep hearing? <laughs> Say, is somebody strangling a horse around here? You know, I thought I heard something. Everything's under control, Mike. It was like a sneeze, and yet it wasn't like a sneeze. It was more like, uh... What's the matter? Uh, won't you have a little drink while you're here? No, thanks. Not while I'm on duty. The uh, Diddlebock isn't really a drink. The what? It's just a little thing I invented in Brother Diddlebock's honor. It's uh, more like a fruit cup, really. A fruit cup with sex appeal. Thanks, it's the same. Thank you. Very fine fellow. One of the finest. There it is again. I could have sworn I heard something. 
I suppose I didn't hear nothing that time. I'm very glad you noticed it, because I did too. Yeah, don't tell me. I've been telling these boys about it, but they're not sure. To me, it sounded like a cross between a Mongolian lynx and a wounded moose. Have you ever hunted the Mongolian lynx? I have not. How about a wounded moose? Likewise. You're probably better off. Why don't you give the gentleman a drink instead of letting him stand there with his tongue hanging out? Look, before your tongue starts hanging out, you better lay off a couple of them diddle pots. A fine thing at 11 o'clock in the morning. Who's he talking to? You? Now, wait a minute. Every Just a moment, officer. My friend may be small, but I want you to know that he's got a heart of gold. And I won't hear one word against him, you understand? When I was in the depths of depression, the dregs of despair, who befriended me? Not E.J. Wiggleberry and Company, not the fellow employees besides whom I toiled for 22 years and whose sorrows I shared, who wouldn't, not the Metropolitan Police Force whose salaries I have paid and whose uniforms I have purchased to keep them warm in winter, cool in summer, and fresh at all times. But young, smolder befriended, when befriended men are nothing, you understand? You handle them. Ha! I Wait a minute. I just saw it. So what? The fellow doing the yelling. He's hiding behind the post there. Probably an escape lunatic. I don't see anybody, Mr. Diddlebach. What do you mean you don't see anybody? You can't see that old crackpot with the spectacles? Why, that's you, Mr. Diddlebach. Me? That old tramp? Why, that doesn't look anything more like me. Look at that collar. Looks like a horse collar. Oh, it ain't so bad, Mr. Diddlebach. How long have I been looking like this? You've always looked like that, Mr. Diddlebach, at least ever since I've known you. Why, this is an outrage. Look at that old scarecrow. Look at that suit. Look at that hat. Look at that face. Oh, it ain't so bad as all that, Mr. Diddlebach. It's worse. Why, I wouldn't trust a face like that to empty a spittoon. Oh, yes, you would, Mr. Diddlebach. Are you positive that's me? Who will get you 12? Then where is there a barber and a jet furnishing outfit? This is a calamity that must be repaired immediately. Right upstairs, Mr. Diddlebach. Only I... Only what? Don't you think you better sit down a little while for it? Sit down? Why should I sit down? Do I look tired? That's the trouble with the men of today. They don't enjoy. They have no... Stamina. Look at our forefathers. Look at Washington. Look at Valley Forge. Look at the pioneers. Then look at me. Hey, are you a barber? I'm looking for one. Yes, but excuse me. Is there a leopard loose in the building or Everything something? Everything is under control. <coughs> men were men in those days. Here, buy yourself a new suit. You look terrible. They mined the earth and dug the rivers and tamed the wilderness and brought forth peaceful homesteads in the shadow of the eagle and the echo of the thundering herd. And in the final analysis, where are they? I ask you, and I reply, dead, my friends, deader than a boiled mackerel. I thank you. Are you all right? A barber in a chair. A barber in a chair. A barber in a chair. You better remember what you put in that so it won't happen again. What's the matter with this? Should old acquaintance be forgot for the sake of old Lang Syne? <laughs> now, if you'll just slip into this, Mr. Diddlebuck. That wouldn't be a little on the quiet side, would it? Yes, I think you're right. Hide not thy light under a bush. You need a tent to hide that one. Well, then we'll try this little Glen awkward plan. Look, murder. Yes. But, well, now, Mr. Diddlebuck indicated to me that he wanted something uh, courageous. I made this for a dog act. I can hear it barking. Oh, very clever. <laughs> I bet they have to get up pretty early in the morning to catch you in bed. It's been tried. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, now, suppose we try this little pin strike. <clears throat> Why? Well, we just thought, the young lady and I, that this was a smidgen on the loud side, a mild view. Oh, oh, you did. It's the check within the check within the check that turns my stomach. Oh, it is. How true. Hello, Max. How depressingly true. Who's the toss part? That's my friend, Mr. Diddlebart. Now, that would call for a waist measurement of about 32. Uh, oh, <laughs> excellent. I'll be back in a flash, and you won't know yourself. Excuse me. Well, so long. Better luck next time. Just a moment. Why are you giving that lowbrow your money? Lowbrow? Now, wait a minute. Now, here, wait a minute. This is Max, the bookies man. Don't you remember that goat I was betting on? This goat? Listen, Chester. No, no, no. Put your. He lost. Why do you bet on goats? You want to bet on something? Bet on horses. They run faster. Yes, sir. You say this animal lost? Totally. Hmm, I see. Well, now is the time to turn defeat into victory through a clever maneuver. Yes, sir. Now, who are the contestants?
Captain to the next sprint. Let's see, window pane, butcher boy. Senor Pepito. Ox nose, pepper pot, crazy Maisie. Get it, Joy. These handles. Perfect, perfect caterpillar and Emmeline. Emmeline? Did you say Emmeline? Yeah, Emmeline. Devoid of speed, probable odds, 30 to 1. Emmeline was my mother's younger sister. You don't tell me. Oh, yes. Yeah. She was a little shorter than mother, though. A little plumper, too, but a very pretty girl. That's remarkable. Mm. Avoid her like poison. She had the prettiest blue eyes. But she's 30 to 1. But no bookie pays more than 15 to 1. I'll take 15. Don't you understand what odds mean? I think so. They represent a difference of opinion. Right. Well, my opinion is Emmeline. She must be a beautiful goat. I mean, if she's She's a horse. Oh, well, all the better. They run faster. I don't want to hurry you, man. But if anybody still wants to get a bet down... I get 15 to 1 for Emmeline. Especially if she wins. A thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. You mean on the nose? Wherever you put it. Now, wait a minute. Take it easy, will you? Don't get excited. It's nothing but a symbol that costs practically nothing to print. There is no shortage of it at any time. Don't do that, Mr. Diddlebar. You have to take chances in this life. Will you Who's take your grand on Emmeline? You don't have to take those kind of chances. Fifteen to one. Don't do that, Mr. What do you mean, my plan? Nonsense. You didn't know Aunt Emmeline. I've got the go right here in my mitt. Here, put it in my mitt. Are you sure? Nonsense. I wish you would change. The die is cast. Of course, it ain't any of my business, but uh, you sure you don't want to think this over? Certainly not. When the iron is hot, strike. Look, Joseph, Obey Joseph. that impulse. Okay, it's your funeral. Okay. I tell you, I got it right here in my mitt. Can't you hear it? You made a bet. Maybe not the best bet in the world, but a bet. They're off. I can hear the short wave. Senor Pepita going to the front by a head. Windapane second, Crazy Maisie third, Butcher Boy fourth, and the Popo Catapetal. Let me hear that. A thousand bucks. Keep quiet. Let me hear that, will you please? Around the chain. It's Pepito in front by three quarters of a length. Window pane a second by a head. Crazy Maisie stay by a head. At the quarter, it's window pane by a head. And oh, here we are, Mr. Diddlebach. I just brought a few Mr. accessories in case. Pepito was Lend second by a head. Now, if you'll just slip into these, Mr. Diddlebach. Certainly. <coughs> Would you mind glancing the other way, uh, dear? With pleasure. Uh-huh. Oh. <laughs> With your permission, Mr. Diddlebach. Butcher Boy got through on the inside and is going to the... Crazy Maisie thwarted. She swerved in the butcher boy on the rail. Then right, the skin on her feet. Thank you. All what this right? noise. Possibly a change of shirt, by Mr. Diddlebach? This one. By all Wind means. Now, if you just slip your coat off, Mr. Diddlebach. <clears throat> crazy Maisie ran wide and bit him. What? She's crazy. Now she's back at the rail in front by a length of Peter. With and there the we are. Very nice. Coming up between horses. <clears throat> The clean for home. It's Crazy Maisie by a length. Pepito was taken by half a length. And Butcher Boy is coming up. No. Butcher Boy is second no. by a length. Butcher Boy is second. Crazy Maisie Th- ran no. wide again. No. What? Here comes Emmeline. Yeah. They're coming up the tree. Oh, oh, They're coming oh. down the line. Head in head. It's crazy Kills Maisie. the suit. Yeah, they kill head. each other. Here comes Emmeline. It's a driving finish. Their nose is apart. They're going across the line. They're finished now and it. Emmeline. By a nice butcher boy, say goodbye, Everlight, and Crazy Maisie is straight in front of that Catapetal and Wind. Is me. A fine brother you turned out to be. I work and slave and give up the best years of my life to make you a home full of charming womanly touches and keep my children pure-minded. As a reward for all this, you come rolling home at midnight in a condition which I, for one, Mr. Little late about midnight. Yes. But where were you all day Wednesday? All day Wednesday. All day Wednesday. You were drunk, that's where you were. Drunk as is probably rolling in a gutter someplace. All day Wednesday? What are you talking about, Flora? I never had a drink in my life. Coming home on horseback. Horseback? Waking up all the neighbors. On horseback? And when old Mrs. Chauncey called out the window, the night was made for sleep, Mr. Diddlebach. You and your drunken friends had to holler back. 
The night was made for love, Mrs. Chauncey, or have you forgotten? I said that. Said it. You sang it. Where's my suit? Well, you came home in this thing. What is it, a horse blanket? It would look as good on a horse as it did on you. You mean I actually walked the streets in this? You rode horseback in the streets in it. I wonder if anybody saw me. Oh, no, of course not. You probably didn't attract any more attention than Lady Godiva in Macy's window at noon. Form fit Franklin, featuring the figure from Nomino. Form fit? I wonder if I get my money back on it. You could try, but I doubt it. You might see what you can get on this while you're at it. Oh, take it off, will you? I feel bad enough as it is. I had a fortune. I had thousands. I had all my savings in one big... Wait a minute. I had tens of thousands. You had tens of thousands. I tell you, I did. Where are my pants? Maybe you threw them out the window. I tell you, I had a fortune in them. You had a fortune in them. And where did you acquire this fortune, may I ask, if I'm not too inquisitive? Is there such a thing as a goat race? A goat race? No, I remember. It was Mother. You say Mother was racing somewhere? Bertha B, that's right. Were there any other angels in the race? It was a horse race. You know what a horse is, don't you? What's the matter with you, Flora? First, I bet on a horse called Emmeline. You remember Aunt Emmeline? She won easily, naturally. Then I took the $15,000 I bet on Emmeline. $15,000? That's right, she paid 15 to 1. I took the $15,000 I bet on Aunt Emmeline and bet it an on mother. On Bertha B. Bertha Birnhoff. You remember your own mother's name, don't you? Yes, and she won too, I suppose. Easily, I presume. You must be on the millions, you presume. I seem to remember a big fat man someplace where there was some very pretty girls dancing the tom-tom and slinging their garters around. Oh, I see it. This big fat man, big-hearted mower, was a generous Jake. He was always smiling, he had a big happy smile, like a shark. He had it right in his pocket for him. He said, all in cash. All he had to do was reach right in and pull it out. He said. That's right. But the government didn't want anybody to have that much in cash. That was it. It wasn't patriotic. For him. That's right. When I said, I suppose that's why they want you to put your money in bonds. He said, bonds, Brother Diddlebach. When they say bonds, they mean investments. And have I got an investment for you, Brother Diddlebach? And what was it? I don't remember. Well, I'll tell you what it was, Brother Diddlebach. It was a drunkard's dream. The horses were nightmares. And the money is just something you never had and are never going to get, Brother Diddlebach, because you're just an old failure. So just get into your clothes and go down to the office and walk in as though nothing had ever happened and probably you'll find nothing did happen. But what about Wednesday, Flora? What was I doing all day Wednesday? Don't tell them you had a cold. They probably had drunks working for them before. I just don't believe it, Flora. If I could only find those pants. Hmm? Oh, boy. Now you'll see whether it was a dream or not, whether I never made any money or never will. Just feast your eyes on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's certainly funny. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Shall I follow you, sir, or will you hop in now? You talking to me? By all means, sir. I said, shall I follow you, or will you hop in now? Uh, just a moment. Why should I ride in that thing? Well, it's your cab, sir. You bought it last Tuesday. My cab? You mean including the horse? Most assuredly, sir. How else would we propel it? What, what, what did I use for money? Why, you had tons of it, sir. And you were most generous and I spirited with it, too, if I may make so bold. I was. Positively, sir. Took me back to the good old days. It was a gorgeous spectacle. Why, hardly anyone could render you the slightest service without you pressing a 50 or at least a 20 into his eager hands. I almost thought once or twice you overdid it, sir. Excuse me, you didn't happen to notice what I did with any of that money, did you? Or even some of it? Oh, you were most free with it, sir. The women were at your feet, sir, if I may make so bold. They were. Prostrate, sir, absolutely horizontal. The weaker sex simply adore a generous man, sir. Excuse me, you wouldn't like to buy this vehicle back in the bargain, would you? I could let you have it very reasonably, including the horse and the whole... But you've already paid me a month's wages, sir. And you gave me to understand the position was permanent. I really hate to disappoint you, but wait a minute. 
You don't happen to know whether a horse called Bertha B won on Tuesday, do you? By all means, won rather easily, I believe, in 201. Then what did I do with you? You mean the tail? Yes, and where was I all day when? <laughs> you mean where weren't we, sir? Oh, it was like the good old days. You'd say Algernon. Your name's Algernon. My name's Thomas, sir, but you had difficulty in remembering it. You called me Algernon James Macbeth, and even Othello once or twice. Excuse me, but... Morning, Mr. Gittlebuck. I thought you'd be over there, but since you wasn't, I'd come over here. Morning, Hamlet. Good morning, Wormy. Now, before you do anything else, you've got to see about getting them some breakfast. Getting them some breakfast? They would like to have their breakfast immediately, if not sooner. Who would like to have their breakfast? The lions. You know anything about any lions? I rejoice to say I do not, sir. The lions have come with the circus. I've been out there for two days. What an aroma. Just what circus are you alluding to? Your circus. And it ain't no illusion. My circus? Who in heaven's name ever gave you the idea that I had a circus? Whoever gave me the idea. You sent me out to take care of it, didn't you? Right in the middle of the party, didn't you? Just when I'm getting in good with this big blonde, I gotta beat it out to Queens just in time for an elephant to squirt a bucket of ice water in my kisser and for one of them cats to... Well, never mind. What Where I the can. how in heaven's name did I ever get a circus? Lucky Leopold give it to you instead of the dough you won from him while Bill Hitchcock lost his circus to him. Then I did win on Bertha B. Oh, sure, for all the good it done you. You said you had always wanted a circus. I did. You did and you have. You sure got your wish. I see. And we have many hungry mouths to feed. Oh, we have. I was hoping it was just a small lion act or something. Maybe one lion and a couple of trained birds, maybe. Uh, one lion. Uh, I just mentioned the lions first because they were yelling the loudest. We got 37 lions. 37? Yes, 37. We also got 14 tigers. 14 tigers? That's right. Also seven bears, some odd jaguars, and a puma. A puma? And what a puma. That's the one. Look, we got horses, a Shetland pony. Never mind. Where'd you say this Noah's Ark is located? Over the bridge in Queens. Then what's the joker? Why did I get it? What's wrong with it? Oh, nothing, except we ain't got no tent to give the show in. You gotta have a fireproof tent, and you can't get a fireproof tent. And we owe six months feed bill and four months back salary. And there's a plaster on every piece of rolling stock and a habeas corpus on the whole world. <laughs> How would you feel about uh, repossessing your circus uh, at a fraction of its original cost? I'd like to be 9,000 miles away from it, home in the arms of my mother. I uh, see. I could make you an exceptionally attractive offer. You couldn't make me an attractive offer, not if you got down your bended knees and threw in a set of dishes. I see. You don't, but you will. The only reason I hung around as long as I did and gambled away my steak was because they were so hungry. And you don't find many people take pity on a lion. That's right. You got any idea how much meat a lion, not a monarch of the jungle, just a small, ordinary lion like, uh, like, uh, oh, like that one there. Come here, Jackie. What? Come here, Jackie. Come up here. You got any idea how much a lion eats per day? I, I, I haven't the slightest idea. 21 pounds <laughs> per day. Quite, 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 quite a pet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like a kitten. Of course, he don't get any choice cuts. Just ordinary meat, but then they don't exactly give it away either. Hi, 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 hi. <laughs> now, you multiply 21 pounds per day by 37 lions, 14 tigers, and nine jaguars. <laughs> and a papuma. And a papuma. Then you multiply that by 30 days by September. April, May, and November. <laughs> June. Yeah, whatever it is. But all the rest have 31, and that means one more big meal. Except February alone, and they only eat 28 times. I see. Did you ever uh, <laughs> try selling them to a, a big circus, a, a Ringling Brothers? Did you ever try selling pills to Carter? Go on away, Jackie. Get yes, away. Uh, how about offering some of them to a zoo? Well, they offered me some of theirs. You did, huh? Yeah. Well, a circus must be really quite a white elephant. I'm glad you brought that up. Have you got any idea how much an elephant eats in, uh, oh, say a week? Hot or cold, rain or shine, 52 weeks a year regular? I uh, haven't the slightest idea. Well, not counting the peanuts, or the 150 pounds of bran, or the 200 pounds of oats, or the 50 gallons of pure spring water they drink to wash it down with, can your mind envision a ton of hay? A ton? A haystack. Of hay? Alfalfa. 
Why, that's impossible. It would die of indigestion. Nothing can eat a ton of hay. An elephant can with ease. Now, let me tell you about the hippopotamus. The hippopotamus does not, as you might suppose, live on a diet of water. <laughs> oh, hello, Gus Lyon. Hippopotamus is all very nice, but where's the fish? Fish? Who wants well, Mr. fish? Mr. Diddlebot. This Friday. There's a few characters out here would like to have a little word with you. Just a moment. We will speak for ourselves, if it's all the same to you, my uh, small friend. You, sir. This is indeed a great pleasure. Uh, Mr. Diddleback, isn't it? The pleasure's all mine, sir, madam. Ethically and morally, we are not responsible for the acts of our predecessor, but sometimes, technically, we are. And now, if you'll come this way and present your statements, uh, one at a time. Uh, there, this one, and now another, and now another. Have you any more? How do you do? What is your trouble, young man? I happen to have some very hungry cats, and I was just wondering if your organization could help me out a little, just temporarily. Most certainly. We're here for that purpose. Uh, it wouldn't matter about the size of the cat? Not a particle. We mother all cats. Uh, that was the desire of our dear benefactor. Very handsome man. Well, that's certainly a relief. Now, have you one or plural cat? Plural. Excellent. And the number, please? Sixty-one, if you want to count that pure. I beg your pardon? Uh, well, in the neighborhood of six. Mm, it's quite a neighborhood. Well, you know how they multiply. Uh, there are ways of controlling that, you know. I don't want to sound cruel, but are you quite sure that being out of work and everything, you could afford to support quite so many of our dear little friends? Well, I'd be very happy to bring over a couple of wagon loads. Oh, not permitted. Or all too soon, our little home would be overflowing. Especially with ours. <laughs> we will go for a distance. The important thing is that they're hungry, isn't it? Of course it is. So I'll just give you a requisition for... Uh, you can fill it the back door. Uh, for, shall we say, six bottles of milk? Oh, let's make it eight bottles of milk. And some nice, freshly chopped... Liver. About how much liver do you think your poor little darlings could manage? Well, uh, would about uh, three tons be asking too much? Three tons? We could have took a couple of pounds of that liver. What for? For lunch. Ah, we got to think along very much broader lines than that. This is a big problem. You're telling me. I used to solve problems all the time when I was in college. Trigonometry, calculus. For the time this would be. You know something? What? I don't think I've thought in years. No fooling. I'm always thinking, always trying to figure an angle. That's because you have to. You haven't got security. You haven't got a job like I have. I mean, like I have. Where you have to get up at the same time every day, eat the same breakfast, go to the office on the same car, work on the same ledger all day, then go home the same way you came to the office, except backwards. Sure makes me dizzy to ride backwards. It doesn't take any thought to do all that, so you don't think anymore, like you stop taking exercise. I sure hate exercise. I was even in love with the same girl all my life, except in different body. Same with me. I gotta have change all the time. So long, Susie. Hello, Nellie. Hail and farewell. You know something else? What? He may have been right to fire. Huh? I'm just an old has -been. What are you talking about? If ever I seen a live wire, a good time Charlie with a rubber off his roll and a whistle for the dame, why, this little problem wouldn't have been no problem at all to you on Tuesday. Where there's a problem, there must be a solution. Where there's a mind, there must be thought. You follow me? Well, at a distance. Where there's a circus, there must be money. You said it. Now, where do you get money? Uh, Wall Street? Correct. And where in Wall Street? A bank? Correct again. And how do you get that money out of that bank? A hold-up? No, no, no. By using your head. Nothing is impossible if you use your head. You can go through granite walls with your head. I nearly done it one time. I tried out a horse. It was a very quick stop. Baraboo. Huh? Baraboo, Wisconsin. A banker from Baraboo, Wisconsin. Uh-huh. The Winter Headquarters, the Ringling Brothers Circus. What's that got to do with it? What's that got to do with it? Any boy from Baraboo, Wisconsin, naturally wanted to hang around the circus as much as they'd let him. All his spare time he was there. He'd carry water for the elephants, take me down to the public library. He chopped meat for the lions, he stuffed hay in the hippopotamus. Naturally, he wanted to run away with the circus. Every American boy does. I see. That's a very clever piece of deductive reasoning, Mr. Diddlebacher, a very brilliant hypothesis. Just plain, but... Uh, you are interested in circuses, aren't you, Mr. Sergeant? Deeply. Splendid. <laughs> Where did you develop your interest in circuses, Mr. Diddlebacher? Uh, I, uh, uh, 
dabble in circuses. You know, jump in, take a small profit, jump out. Ah, yes, it's that last part that's the hard part. Yes, I uh, might have wished that you were a true lover of circuses rather than just a trader in them, but beggars can't be choosers. How true. And now, Mr. Those Sergeant... Those elephants. How soon would you be ready to take over my circus? Take over your circus? Well, time is of the essence, naturally. You must have found owning circuses before. But once you make up your mind of the scores of one of them, the sooner the yes, sweeter. But, uh, Oh, yes, it is. Perhaps I shouldn't tell you this, but you certainly came on the right day. I've just received my monthly key no. bills, and I'm prepared to make you a genuine bargain. No, no, I'll no. meet you more than halfway. In fact, I'm willing to take a stupendous loss. I'll make you such a sacrifice. No. Oh, yes, I will. This is the end. By God, we can acquire my circus in such a reasonable mean terms that you can acquire my circus. That's right. Give that to me again. We got the circus, and you being fond of circuses, we thought naturally you'd be... That you could sell it to me. Uh-huh. I... Uh, I knew this was too good to be true. Now, I hate bankers. Why? Because they won't lend you any money like they're supposed to. Everybody hates them. Don't you hate them? I never thought much about it. Now, let's see. Why would a banker want to buy a circus? Take off his income tax? Now, I don't think they pay income tax. At least you never see their names up very high in the list. They're yeah, leaving us to pay it firm. I hate bankers. Could he be sorry for the animals? A banker? What we need is an argument. What we need is some meat. That'll come. Now, why would you buy a circus if you were a banker? I wouldn't. Even if you could afford it? I should say not. Hooey. Why, well, I would. I guess maybe that's why I bought one. I was always going to buy a circus when I got rich. You sure bought one. Keep it in the poorest part of town. Let all the kids in for nothing. All year round. Just to see their faces. You get awful tired of that whiff. Wait a minute. You say everybody hates bankers? Naturally. There you are. Huh? Nothing to it. Where's there another bank? They're all banks. Then come on. What happened? We just sold a circus. Huh? James R. Smoking Company. James R. Morning, Smoke. gentlemen. Morning. Is Mr. Smoking? We'd like to smoke him out. We'll go inside, we're me. You got an appointment? Uh, we'll make an appointment. What do you want to see him about? An, an investment. Of what? What's it your business? Well, go ahead. I'm not stopping you. There are plenty of people inside for that. Want to try it? Big mug. Come on, Wormy. What? I hate bankers. Well? Listen, you. We... We didn't figure this out far enough. You've got to figure these things out to the bitter end. What you'll do, then what they'll do. Then what you'll do after that, then what they'll do, then what you'll do after that. It's like, do you play chess? No. I don't either. Maybe if you wore the other suit and the big Kelly. What for? To frighten them? No. What we need is an open sesame. Well, no, we can dig up a couple of blackjacks. No, no, no. What we need is a rule. Oh. Did you ever hear of the Trojan horse? Where was he running? Forget it. There's nothing that succeeds like success. No. Like thought. With thought, you can penetrate granite walls. Right, big mug. All we need, then, is a thought. But that goes all the way through. Right. That don't stop at the bitter end. Right. You and your little brother. Never mind that. There's nothing to it. What's we'll it? be in jail by 3.30? Huh? Out again by a quarter to five? Huh? I've got it. Absolutely and beyond question, it cannot fail. Uh, what is it this time? We've just sold the circus, that's all. Again? Right. Come on. Must you go? We'll be back. You'll find out, you big stiff. Right. 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 Since you have repeatedly failed to clean up this matter, despite numerous warnings from me, which I was in no way obligated to show... Which we were uh, in no way obligated to show. We are reluctantly forced to inform you that we will have to take over your building. As of the... <laughs> oh! Oh! Ha, ha, ha! 
I hope we're not intruding. Mr. Smoke, I presume? I wonder if I could have a few moments of your valuable time. <laughs> Mr. Smoke, where are you, Mr. Smoke? Now, wait a minute, Jackie. No! <laughs> will you, will you take that little thing out of here? He wouldn't hurt a butterfly, Mr. Smoke. Butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Give the gentleman your paw, Jackie. Here, give Mr. Smoke a drink. It's nothing. It's called the Diddle I have only a few moments before the police reserves arrive, so I will be extremely brief. As you know, Mr. Smoke, you are loathed by everyone. Whoa, why? Because you are a banker. Yes. I am here to repopularize you overnight through the medium of the James R. Smoke year-round free circus for children. Adults, 55 cents. Remember that the richest man in the world spent millions to become popular. I will make you popular overnight and for nothing. Yes. There's only one circus in the world for sale. Fly, yes. Jackie. I have it. The James R. Smoke year-round free circus for children. Adults, 55 cents. The price is $30,000. I will leave you with that thought. My name is Diddlebuck. You can locate me through the papers. Good day. Come on, Jackie. Come on, boy. Good day. Buck, as in beer. Uh, diddle, uh, oh. Year-round free circus for children. Remember those words. Adults, 55 cents. As you know, Mr. Margo, you are abominated by everybody. And my plan is to make here have a drink. Up it's nothing. Stand back, Mr. Wild Animal. Stand back, Mr. Wild Animal. Get up, Jackie. As you know, Mr. Blackson, you are despised, reviled, and detested by all normal human beings. My plan is to undo this great wrong through the medium of the Jeremiah T. Blackson year-round free service for poor children. I don't think if I say, drop that gun. Here, have a drink. <laughs> like this, but I want you to know about the McDuffie year-round free circus for poor children. I don't 55 cents. As you know, Mr. McDuffie... Just a minute, young man. What do you mean crashing in here without being announced? What you got there, dog? He don't smell nice. Why don't you give him a bath? I'll get out of here before I ring for the janitor. Now, if I can ever find that Tessie Bell, and have you escorted to the street pronto. Go on out now. The McDuffie circus would make you very popular. I don't want to be popular. I don't like nobody, and nobody likes me. If it's all right with them, it's all right with me. Here, have a drink. Yeah. Certainly, that's the one thing I do like. The McDuffie circus will probably... Very make... nice. Man's only friend. Now, get that dog out of here. I hate dogs. You, Rover. Go on, get out. Get out. Now, where are you? Get out of here now. I can smell you, but I can't. No! No! Hey! Jackie! Look out for Jackie! Here, Jackie! Here, Jackie! Now look what you've done. Here, Jackie!
to the end window. All right. Stay back, boy. No. It's locked. Try the other one. All right. No, Jackie. Show no. this one. Huh? Try this one over here. Right. Here. Keep right in there, boy. Quiet now. Stay right. It's locked, too. Huh? I'll try the other one. Right. Right. Back there. Be quiet, boy. Ah! It's the No! Hand! Do, do, do something! Here! Keep on, boy! Come on, Give me your hand now! Look, 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 careful! Hey! Oh. No, no, no! Please, wait a minute, wait a minute! Come on, Bubba! Come on, hold my hand! Look out! Look out! What are you doing? Hey! 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 Oh. No, 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 no! What? Don't mind it, with you! Oh. I tell you, it's enough for now! Stay back, Now I don't mind you, Stay back! Oh, oh, my! I'll buy you another pair. They was only from the dime store, but it took me three weeks to pick them up. Where are you? Never mind. Look out! Look out! Here go! Mr. Gentleman. Oh! Oh! Please, Mr. Gentleman. What are you trying to do here? You don't see the an under Get Careful now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, ah! No, hang on. Oh! Ah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. No! No, no, stay back there. Come on. I'll show you how to open the window. Wait a minute. Don't frighten Jackie. He don't frighten that easy. This is one time I thought the thought all the way. Get back, Jackie. And I ain't going over that precipice again. Now, hey. Stay there, Jackie, now. Now, be quiet, Jackie. That's a nice old iron. Only be a second now. Only be a second now. Be careful, boy. Oh, no. What you done? For heaven's sake. <laughs> Careful, Jackie. Please, stay back there now. Stay still. What's the matter with you? Be I, careful. I want to cut your arm off. Yeah. I thought I told you not to make any noise. How can you throw a telephone show a plate glass window without making any noise? You thought to two plate glass windows. Oh, what a mess. Uh, can you see him? There's a good old Jackie. There's a good boy. Oh, there's a good old Jackie. There's a boy. But just let me get to uh, have you got a hold of me? I've got a coat. Hang on now, I'm going to change. I got you. Right, Jackie, get your tail out of the way now. Hang on. Now, be Easy now. Yeah. Hey, no, no, no. No. Hang on to me, Mr. Dillard. No. Get back to me. Quiet, Jackie. Hey, I'll be. Get me in the finest. Shoo. 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 Jackie.
in here. Thought you didn't like jail. Uh, this is the first time I ever appreciated one. Oh, your coat is so solid. Don't they build them nice? Well, we'll be out of it pretty soon. No hurry. <coughs> well, you gotta get over this, you know. That wasn't part of the plan at all. You're telling me. Now, let's see. I said that we'd be in jail by 3.30. We are, and I love it. And out again by a quarter to five. We ain't, and it's all right with me. Good old Jackie, did you stick your neck out? They ought to be here with certified checks. Who? The bankers. They have to come with certified checks. There's nothing in this world as strong as a good idea. Never has failed, never will fail. It cannot fail. The thought is planted. One more second, they could have planted us, too. Can you imagine watching a trapeze act? Oh! And the cop. Who? The bankers. Now, you just watch. Pretend to be indifferent. Right, right, right. Young lady bailed you out. A young lady? The banker's secretary. He sent her over. Come on. Hello, Mr. Diddlebock. I'm so sorry. You're in trouble. What was that? Why, Miss Otis? That's just Jackie. Don't pay any attention to him. You bailed me out? Well, naturally, Mr. Diddlebock. We just put our savings together. That's all. He can't get out, can he? Of course not. That's all savings are for, anyway. Naturally, they weren't all mine. Hortense had the most, of course, seen the others. Naturally. And when we heard you were in trouble, are you sure that this is strong enough? Of course they are. They keep murders in them. I can't thank you enough, my dear Miss Otis. I'm terribly touched, and as soon as I have a minute, I'll thank you for hours. But I'm not in the slightest trouble. This is all part of a plan, a foolproof plan. That cannot fail. That cannot fail. Oh, I thought you were in trouble. Far from it. Do I look as if I were in trouble? <laughs> now, you didn't have to see any bankers downstairs on your way up here, did you? No, I didn't, Mr. Diddlebock. Only a colored man. What was he doing? Mopping the floor, except the sergeant. They've who... had plenty of time to get here. At least one of them should have come to steal a march on the others. They must know where I am. The paper says exactly. The Battery Park Police Station. You didn't have any trouble finding me, did you? I didn't see the papers, Mr. Diddlebock. Your coachman came and got me. Why, there's life, there's hope, sir. And while you was acrobatic in this afternoon, I was thinking to myself... Thanks. I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Diddlebock. I don't know exactly what you're disappointed about. But maybe you could get arrested some other time, if that's what you're trying to do. Well, that's that. But I just can't understand it. Come on, Wormy. We'll take Miss Otis home anyway. It's about all we have to offer. And we'll come back and get Jack in. Well, I'd be glad to go back in jail, Miss Otis, if it would get you your savings back. Don't talk nonsense, Mr. Diddlebuck. Don't be depressed. The day is always dark. I don't... know, just before the cyclone. Say. What's the Battery Park Police Station doing on Canal Street? The Battery Park Police Station, too? Yes, that's where the paper said I was. Oh, they couldn't take you in. There wasn't room. Some roisterers of some kind got in ahead of you. Or they didn't like lions or something. Then where is the Battery Park Police Station? Why, in Battery Park, sir, naturally. Then what are you waiting for? Get in. You see what I told you? Hot dog, let's go! <laughs> Bankers around here. I didn't hear Jeff what you say.
Do you feel better now? I thought a little air would do you good. It's very kind of you. Oh, yes, this is my cab, isn't it? What a day. Hey, was I hanging off a line from a building, or did I have a nightmare? I'm afraid you did, Mr. Diddlebar. I mean, hang off the building. But I really wish you wouldn't anymore, now that it isn't necessary. You wish I wouldn't. I mean, now that you're a member of the firm and everything. What firm is that? Why, Waggleberry and Company, where you always work. You say I'm a... But of course you are. Mr. Waggleberry said that Sergeant's free circus idea was the best advertising idea he'd heard of since Brody jumped off the bridge. And then when you got the accountant off... You say Sergeant bought the circus? Oh, no, he already had a circus of his own. Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey bought your circus. Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey? You mean for money? He certainly didn't buy it for peanuts. But... I thought that there were some bankers. Weren't there some bankers who wanted it or something? Oh, yes, but they didn't want it as much as Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey wanted it. They just wanted it for the free circus idea, which Mr. Sargent already had, which made you a member of the firm. But Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey really wanted it. The bankers never got any higher than $150,000. $150,000? That's right. But when Ringling Brothers don't like something, they really don't like they it. don't like... They don't like free circuses. $175,000 worth, they don't like them. Here's your seventy. Oh, oh. I'm so happy for you, Mr. Diddlebach. I mean, so much happening in such a short time. I'm very proud of you, too. You must be terribly intelligent. Oh. I beg your pardon, Mr. Diddlebach? 175,000. That's right. You see, it's written... Oh. It's written twice. Oh, you're wearing it. The engagement ring. I remember now. 175,000. How beautiful it looks on your little head. I see. What's the matter, Mr. Biddlebach? This ought to be the happiest day of my life. The unexpected job, the unexpected money, the... But it isn't. Funny, isn't it? I'm not quite sure I understand, Mr. Biddlebach. What's so difficult to understand about it? I just said that I'm very happy for you. If I didn't say it, I meant it. I've just made a killing in circuses. I am, you tell me, a member of a large advertising firm, and I don't know how much per year, if ever I could afford to support a... Uh, it's now, and once again, I've just lost one of the few girls in the world. The last one. I am naturally delighted. Excuse me for even thinking like this. Now, if you tell me where you live, I'll take you home. You mean you don't remember, Mr. Diddlebach? Remember what? What is it for me to remember? What I want to do is to learn how to forget. Remember that you married me. Remember that I married you. How's that again? I said, don't you remember marrying me, Mr. Diddlebach? Marrying you, Mr. Diddlebach? How could I possibly remember marrying you, Mr. Diddlebach? In the first place, your name is Mr. Diddlebach. In the second place... You mean you don't remember coming out to Flatbush in the middle of the night with a full orchestra? Flatbush? And waking up the whole neighborhood while you told Mother it was about time you did something about one of her daughters and then wrapping me in a long velvet cloak that turned out afterwards to be a window curtain and then galloping all the way back to New Jersey. I'll bet you fell it. Are you sure of your facts, Miss Otis? Am I sure? Really, Mr. Diddlebach? This is terrible, Miss Otis. I'll never forgive myself if I live to be to be. I mean, the difference in our age alone is... I mean to say not that I don't worship the very ground you walk on, but I mean, looking at us together, I must have been out of my mind. I was out of my mind. Why didn't you resist me, Miss Otis? Because you were irresistible. Irresistible, irresistible, my grandmother's poodle. I mean to say, look at me. I'm looking at you, Miss What do you see? Husband. Your husband, piffle, bunk, sentimental drip -trap. Fortunately, there's still time to rectify this nonsense, this miscarriage of a... We'll have it a no I for you. I don't think that would be practical, Mr. Biddlebach. All right, then you can go to Reno or any place else that you like. At least I can afford it now. What do you mean it wouldn't be practical? I'll always be glad to look after you as generously and as well as I know how. Anything that I have is yours, Miss Otis. Everything I have is yours, Mr. Diddlebach. And I'll tell you something else, Mr. Diddlebach. I'm not going to Reno or any place else because you see, Mr. Diddlebach, it took you so long to make up your mind and join our family that now that we have you, we don't think we'd better ever let you go. But my dear Miss Miss. And I'll tell you oh, something sir. else, Mr. Diddlebach, that you also haven't bothered to ask me. I, I love you, Mr. Diddlebach. My dear Miss Otis, I, 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 my dear child. Oh, my dear. That must be what I was doing all day Wednesday. <laughs>
Okay, well, uh, I think the moral of the story to that is alcohol solves everything. Now, had I run the recut or re recut possibly version of this Mad Wednesday from 1950, uh, Jackie, if memory serves, would have talked a bit at the end. Uh, we would have seen a little bit more of Jackie. Parts of the movie got reshot. But at the same time, we would have lost a lot of the character development. So it is kind of a, a, a bit of a trade. And Mad Wednesday's uh, quite a bit shorter a movie, too. Now, uh, of course, as far as I'm concerned, the movie just kind of fell apart towards the end there. Uh, the whole scene with uh, Francis Ramsden, the, Petty, the Betty Page look-alike. Uh, and I should note, this was her only... A uh, real proper movie role. I think she was in two other movies, but just as an extra. And uh, she, uh, like so many young actresses, married a millionaire and lived the good life for the rest of her life. And I think she only passed away in the early 2000s. And of course, Harold Lloyd passed away in 1971. And I think we just uh, passed the anniversary of Lloyd's passing pretty recently, just in the last few weeks. So anyway, that is it for the movie, and that is eh, effectively it for tonight. Um, I do hope to do this uh, like once a month, every other month, but uh, boy, the, uh, the streaming problems tonight. I do not know what is with either YouTube or my internet or what. I, I turned the bitrate way, way, way down on this, and it was still a bit clunky, and I turned off my studio lights to see if they were interfering, and not really. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I still got some bugs to work out here. But I I would like to do this on a you know semi-regular basis. I've got uh, boxes full of public domain tapes, and uh, kind of all stripes. Uh, stuff that is pretty well known, some deep cuts, some... Silence. We've done silence already. If you saw the Arbuckle film, uh, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle film that I did on Leap Day. And uh, yeah, it would just be nice to share some of that and, uh, you know, just chat a little, drain the movie and just enjoy it. So uh, yeah, hopefully I can turn this into something resembling a reasonably well-running machine of a show, uh, especially since you know uh, you know my situation at home, as it were, uh, has kind of forced me to cut my regular archive production schedule in half. So this way I can do something that's reasonably substantial and live, and you know prove that I'm not dead. That probably helps quite a bit. So anyway, that is going to be it for tonight. Next week is going to be the first round of random audio cassettes that I've done on Archive in about four years now. And it's going to be all music this time. So keep an eye out for that. Otherwise, thanks for joining me, my little uh, cult within a cult within a cult sort of live stream show here. I will see you again soon. That wasn't a very graceful ending, was it? <laughs>